The purpose of the Reveal AF study was to investigate uh, whether patients who have risk markers for both the development of atrial fibrillation and the development of stroke, but no history of AFib, in fact, have atrial fibrillation that has previously been unknown to the patient and the physician, that's called undetected or silent atrial fibrillation. The implications are that if atrial fibrillation that's silent is present in such patients with any significant frequency, then perhaps prophylactic therapy could prevent the consequences that we know occur with atrial fibrillation, such as stroke. The study design was to take patients who have demographic risk criteria, basically the CHADS score having to be three or higher, or a CHAD score of two plus either coronary disease, chronic renal insufficiency, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or obstructive sleep apnea, and to implant um, a loop recorder that continually records for up to three years. The trial's uh, primary endpoint, though, was of the frequency of detected atrial fibrillation of six minutes or longer at 18 months, but we also looked at other time points in the trial. Patients were excluded if they had any history of atrial fibrillation, if they had a stroke or TIA within the past year, if they had uh, other reasons to already be on an anticoagulant, and so forth. That list is available in a publication that uh, described the methods of the study in the American Heart Journal now two and a half years ago. Our findings were, uh, I think, impressive. We found that at 18 months, almost 30 percent, almost 30 percent of patients had atrial fibrillation of six minutes or longer. At 30 months, in contrast to 18 months, 40 percent had atrial fibrillation of six minutes or longer. And a significant percentage of those patients weren't just six minutes, but they had atrial fibrillation uh, of six or more hours per day. About 10 percent of those who reached the primary 18-month endpoint had episodes that lasted 24 hours or longer. So this, these are not just one or two episodes in these patients. So it's not uncommon in this population. Additionally, the median time to the first detection was 123 days, roughly four months. Uh, if we had monitored it only for 30 days, which is the common limit for external monitors, we would have picked up only 6 percent. So the yield was impressively higher, and a 30-day monitor would not suffice for this type of detection purpose. Well, I think we have to pool it with other studies. There are two previously performed smaller trials, shorter in duration. Our median follow-up was 22 months. The others were closer to a year, predate AF and assert two. But importantly, they also found a significant frequency of silent AF in similar types of patients. So when you put that data together, I think it's fair to say that there's solid evidence that silent AF is not rare in patients who are identified by their clinical characteristics. The implications, though, um, less clear at this point. So for example, roughly 55% of physicians once told in Reveal that their patients had atrial fibrillation um, put the patients on an anticoagulant. Or said another way, by the end of the trial, roughly 55% round numbers uh, were taking an oral anticoagulant that they were not taking before the trial. Should they be? don't know without the completion of two additional studies that are currently ongoing. One of those is the Artesia trial, one of those in Europe is the NOAA AFNET trial, and those trials are examining uh, the use of anticoagulants, specifically apixaban and adoxaban, versus one trial aspirin, the other trial placebo, in patients who have silent AF detected uh, incidentally uh, by their implanted, already implanted pacemakers. Uh, or defibrillators. If in fact in the, those two trials we show that prophylactic anticoagulation of silent AF reduces stroke and prophylactic we could say treatment for heart failure, rate control, reduces other outcomes and we've now coupled that with the ability to in, insert, not implant any longer, but insert a simple uh, plunger through the skin inserts the, the new small monitors I think the implications are significant. 
know, maybe patients who have CHAD scores of three or higher um, should routinely undergo monitoring. I think we're about three to four years away from um, making that a definitive statement or seeing it in the guidelines. But when you put these data sets together, I think it's pretty impressive. So future research in this area, I think, are to continue these kinds of studies in larger data sets, uh, to utilize prophylactic uh, initiation of therapy and measure objective endpoints to show that such therapy in patients with silent AF uh, achieves the same benefits for patients as such therapy in symptomatic patients with AFib who've come to attention because of their fibrillation. There's no reason to think that the results won't be positive. The atria that are abnormal in patients with heart disease and fibrillation shouldn't really care whether the patient feels symptoms such as palpitations. It's the atria abnormalities that promote clot. So if I had to predict, I would say silent AF will turn out to be as important as symptomatic AF, and prophylactic therapy will be important in reducing embolic risks. But three to four years, we'll know for sure.